Okay, hi everyone. This is going to be the sort of summary video for the chapter one PowerPoint. Uh, this is just going to be high level, right? It's meant to help you prepare for the exam review. It's uh, not a substitute for coming to class, so it's just kind of short. Uh, the highlights, high level stuff. Again, sometimes with accounting, you need to hear this, see this multiple times, so I'm happy to kind of give you a, a one-shot overview here of it. So with chapter one, it's just kind of the basics, right? We're kind of rehashing accounting, what, what's it all about? And in this way, right, when we're talking about accounting, right, it's really meant, uh, and a lot of people don't think it this way, for the public good, right? We're trying to kind of help others, uh, specifically, right, people who are investing in the stock market uh, rely on us because they want to make sure that the financial information is presented uh, accurately and fairly. And then uh, also, right, people need to do their tax returns. They need uh, help uh, with their bookkeeping, their audits. So we're really serving the public uh, as accountants. And really, when we're talking about accounting, right, in this class, financial accounting, we're concerned with external users. So people external from the business, specifically investors, lenders, and creditors, right? Uh, you can think of it like sharks on Shark Tank, for example, right? They want to know before they invest in a business, what uh, is the financial health of this business? Give me some numbers, give me some financials. And really when we're talking about financial accounting, right? You have four financial statements, the balance sheet, the income statement, the statement of cash flows, and the statement of shareholders' equity. And again, we're talking about providing uh, these four documents to external users of the business. So uh, who produces these financial statements, right? Well, typically you would think like uh, big corporations, uh, like large multinational corporations for like the, the national stock exchanges. Uh, however, everyday businesses, right, need to produce them, right? If you're a maybe a, a smaller medium construction firm and uh, you want to get a new piece of equipment, right, you may go to a bank to get a loan and the banker is going to say, hey, we need audited financial statements, okay? So uh, the users of it, right, these are going to be like investors, like people who want to invest in the stock market, lenders, creditors, right, like the bank, for example, they want to see this kind of stuff. And really, when we're talking about that sort of like stock market, when you talk about the stock market in general, we're really referring to capital markets. Okay. And the reason here, right, why would somebody lend money uh, to a, a corporation or a, a business or like somebody who's on Shark Tank? Well, it's like anything, right? They want to make money on their money. When the sharks invest on Shark Tank, they aren't doing it like charitably, right? They want to make money on their money. So uh, how would we calculate like the rate of return, right? Because that's what the sharks are interested in. What am I going to make on this? Uh, really, it's going to be the income that you have from it divided by your investment, right? So you can look at this example here uh, in these sort of like high level overviews. I'm not going to get sort of in the nuances of this, but you can check that out. Uh, another sort of example for here to, for you to look at here. Um, this is just saying, uh, hey, what would you rather invest in, right? Uh, for example, if you had 10 grand, would you rather throw it in a savings account that was backed by the government that you get 5% on, or would you put it in the stock market? So this is kind of a, a trick question in the sense like, well, I would need to know more about that stock market, right? Give me some of those financial statements. Whereas, you know, the government back thing, that's like pretty reliable from its uh, because it's from the government, right? So the primary objective of financial accounting, right? So it's kind of like Star Trek, Next Gen, if you've ever seen that, right? Like the fundamental mission is to explore new universes. Here with financial accounting, the fundamental objective is really to provide useful information, right? That's the main thing that we're trying to do and get across here, right? We want to help uh, those investors, lenders, and creditors and provide them with useful information so they can make informed decisions about whether they want to invest in the company or not. And when we're talking about financial accounting, it really kind of has two flavors to it. You have cash basis versus accrual. Uh, what's the difference here? Well, this is really when you recognize or book uh, the, the revenue and the expense. 
under the cash basis of accounting, right, the general rule is going to be cash in, revenue, cash out, expense. Whereas under the accrual basis of accounting, the general rule is going to be you recognize a revenue, that is to say credit a revenue, whenever you earn that revenue. And likewise, you recognize an expense, that is to say you debit the expense uh, whenever you incur that expense. We're not looking at when you pay the cash, right? We're looking when you earn or incur it. So this is just kind of showing you an example here of like why and what is the difference between them. So, hey, we have uh, somebody who prepays three years of rent, 60 grand. If their cash basis, right, they're taking that entire expense in year one because it was you know, cash outflow expense then. Whereas in distinction, right, if they are accrual basis, they'll take the expense as they incur it, right? Like 20 in year one, 20 in year two, 20 in year three. And the idea with this is uh, between like the cash and the accrual basis, the accrual basis is like more accurate, right? It's like more fairly presenting uh, the financial health of the company. Right, because really you're incurring that expense over the three years. That's when you're, you know, utilizing the office or whatever it is you're renting. And uh, another kind of example, right, might be like something like sales on credit, right? That would be like the flip side of it. Uh, for uh, cash basis, you wouldn't record that until you actually collect the cash. For uh, accrual basis, you would record it, uh, you know, whenever you earn the revenue. So it's just kind of a, a different spin on it there. All right, so. Uh, there's an MCQ. You can look at that. Uh, when we're talking about accounting, right, we're really talking about uh, gap, right? When we say gap, namely generally accepted accounting principles, you can think of that sort of as like the rule book for accounting, right? How do we know we debit this? How do we know we credit that, right? What are the rules that guide and tell us how to sort of uh, perform accounting, right? The procedure here, you know, substantive and procedural. So really when we talk about gap, that's the idea of it. Why do we have it? Uh, one, not only to tell us how to do the accounting, but two, also for comparability purposes, right? If you pick up, right, say you got a million dollars to invest and you pick up, you know, one company's balance sheet and you pick up another company's balance sheet, gap is sort of like, you know, it's a universal thing in the sense that you can understand the rules and processes and procedures. You can now compare these, right? It's like a fantasy football league, uh, right? Like if somebody comes up to you and was like, I got like 40 points in my league this week without knowing the under underlying kind of scoring mechanism or what points are worth in that league, it's going to be meaningless. So we have kind of like, it would almost be like having a universal rule set for fantasy football, for uh, accounting, we have gap, which lets us kind of compare. So if you came up to me and you were like, hey, we made uh, $1,000 in net income, I would know sort of like at a high level how that was calculated, what that means, what you counted as revenues, what you counted as expenses. So when we talk about gap, right, we kind of have the hierarchy here, right? So you got the federal government with Congress. They created the SEC, which is sort of a protective body for investors. Uh, they have delegated sort of the accounting rulemaking, so who makes GAAP, to FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, all right? A few other kind of things here, right? So the SEC, we talked about that. They have the 33 versus the 34 Exchange Act. So the difference here is who does it apply to? Is this the IPO, the initial public offering, when a company wants to go from being privately owned to publicly owned, uh, or is this a secondary uh, transaction, right? So it's almost like you could think of it like, are you buying your car new, uh, a primary offering, or is it used, right? Like somebody else had already bought this new. Okay, so you can look that look at that there. Uh, a few other you know areas here. These are kind of the precursors to the FASB, right? The FASB is the big guy, right? They're the one who creates GAAP, right? So that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, they do have these emerging issues task force, right? This emerging issues task force. So this is going to identify financial reporting issues and attempts to resolve them without involving the FASB, right? So you can look at that. Uh, GASB, right? That's for governments. They help give them the rules and processes and procedures for governmental accounting. 
Uh, right, so here you can check out that MCQ. Um, now when we talk about the FASB, right, they have the sort of FASB accounting standards codification. Right, it's almost like in the same way that the federal government has all like the statutes and the codes and you would walk into a law library and there'd be like all these books like code section one, two, three, FASB like similarly codifies their rule, right? Um, and essentially the scheme here, the format, don't memorize this, right? But just kind of be aware that, yeah, they have a codification is they break it out, right? So, hey, maybe your assets are in the 300s, your liabilities are in the 400s. So if you like had a question, right, maybe you were preparing financial statements or you were conducting an audit and you were like, what's the proper treatment for this? Well, you may go look at these accounting standard codifications. Outside of the U.S., right, so we have um, essentially the functional equivalent of the FASB, which is known as the IASB, right? So it used to be the IASC, now it's the IASB. What is this? It's the International Accounting Standards Board. So you could think of them essentially like uh, FASB, but for the rest of the world. And the idea with this is, and there are some exceptions, it's kind of like uh, the metric system, right? The rest of the world uses the metric system, but here in the US, right, we're using kind of inches, feet, miles, uh, a different system. In the same way, right, while in the US we generally use GAAP, like US GAAP, the rest of the world uh, follows the IASB standards, namely IFRS. Now you can have GAAP outside of the US, it's possible, but the sort of like high level, uh, think about it, like in the US, we use GAAP. Outside of the US, they follow IFRS. Right. And the idea with the IFRS is uh, it's kind of like similar to GAAP. There's a lot of things that uh, are the same, but but there are differences right to it enough where it's um, like meaningful difference where it can have like a big effect if you're using one system or the other. So this is just kind of showing you here what's the framework. Right. Uh, who are these bodies? And don't get caught up too much in this minutia here of these like specific bodies. Um, and we said, right, that they produce IFRS. You know, other countries outside of the U.S. tend to follow IFRS. And once upon a time, right, maybe like 10, 15, 20 years ago, there was a big movement to try to consolidate these two frameworks, right? I, I think like sometime in the 70s or I don't know when, but like once upon a time, they tried like putting the metric system in the U.S. and like it did not go well. And they were just like, we're not doing that. In the same way, like a similar thing happened here with GAAP and IFRS. At one point in time, they were trying to converge this, right? So um, if you think about it, right, like say you're Coca-Cola or something, you sell Coke all over the world. This is going to be a headache to do your financial statements in the sense like, yeah, for your U.S. stuff, you're going to use GAAP. Uh, but for your maybe your European sales, you may use IFRS. Uh, so like internal to a company, it would be a headache, right? Likewise for investors, how do you know, right? Like maybe here we're in the U.S., you give me some financial statements, I can look at them. But um, how do I know what's going on with like European or Chinese financial statements, right? So the problem becomes like functionally, uh, as well as from a comparability perspective, uh, separating these causes headaches. So they were like, well, from an efficiency standpoint, right? Accountants love efficiency. Why don't we try to converge these? And uh, much like the metric system trying to be in the U.S., uh, this did not work as planned, right? So essentially, uh, like, for example, when I took the CPA exam, you had to know a lot of the, like, sort of minutia, the differences between them, because this, like, convergence effort was, like, really a thing. It, it's sort of like how all these companies are like, we're going to be, you know, emission free by 2030 or 2040, right? Like the car companies. Uh, for a period of time here, they were like, we're going to converge these by X date. And as they got closer and closer to that date, they're just like, this isn't happening, right? So uh, they are, right, still considering it, right? It's always like the dream of this happening, but uh at least for the time being, right, it's best here in the U.S., right, you're going to be a public accountant here, just practice as an accountant. We're looking at GAAP, okay? 
So this just lays uh, a little bit of a framework out, right? How does FASB sort of make those rules, the accounting standards codifications, right? This gives you the procedure for it. Look over it, right? I'm not going to be on the exam, like, please tell me step six. I'm more concerned with the blocking and tackling. Uh, you know, you'd be better off doing sort of like MCQs, the optional problems, uh, you know, looking at this high level. Don't get caught down in the, the PowerPoint, the minutia of it. Okay. Uh, the next couple of slides are just saying, hey, in the US with GAAP and hey, outside of there with IFRS, uh, accounting is linked to politics, right? It's kind of like anything. When you get money involved uh, and you're setting standards, uh, there's ways you can manipulate it or like tactics, techniques. Uh, not everything's going to be popular, right? It's kind of like designing a tax code, right? Whenever you do that, some people are going to win, some people are going to lose. So uh, yes, we do have FASB, which is sort of like its own standard setter. Uh, but when it makes and produces a gap, Right, that's not done in a vacuum. A lot of people are going to be affected by it. Okay, so next thing, uh, you know, they kind of talk a little bit about here is an auditor, right? So what do auditors do? Uh, they essentially go in and verify, look at financial statements to make sure that they're fairly presented, right? And really, there's two reasons why you would have an auditor in real life, right? If you're a large multinational corporation, an MNC, right, you're publicly traded, you want to be on the stock exchange, you are required as a condition to being on the exchange that you produce audited financial statements, right? So like, for example, when I was at Deloitte, uh, you know, they do audits for like Walmart and Nike, right? All these like big publicly traded companies. On the flip end, right, um, if, if you're like maybe a smaller medium business, as we talked about before, hey, you're trying to get a loan to grow, you need audited financial statements. So again, the, the nature of the firm you're at, if you wanna go into public accounting, will sort of uh, dictate the, the size of your client. Generally, you go to a like large big four firm, for example, you're gonna get really large clients. You go to a medium firm, right? I was in, in practice at a medium firm. We had more like local clients, right? Like things you would see in your neighborhood, sort of like local businesses. So it's kind of one of the cool things with accounting is there's like a variety of uh, jobs in it. You can go public, you can go private, you can go audit, you can go tax. There's the CPA, the CMA, the CFE. It's like a lot of flexibility in it, okay? And the idea with it with the CPA here, right, that's kind of, and depending on who you talk to, but I would, I would probably say it's fair to say uh, that's the most impressive accounting standard. So, uh, you know, it takes you know, four grueling exams. You got to have 150 credits to be licensed. Uh, but the idea with it is the CPA, if you get that, it gives you a lot of things you can do with it, right? You're allowed to sign off on an audit. You can, uh, in certain situations, deal with the IRS or uh, sign off on returns, right? And the reality is, like, if you go into public accounting, most public accounting firms won't let you become a manager unless and until you have the CPA. So it's kind of like the rite of passage for people who go into public accounting. Uh, it's not something you have to do, right? It's, like, totally fine. Many people who are accountants who don't do it. But um, in public accounting, it, it's like a very big deal. Now, uh, a little bit about sort of the history here. We're talking about auditors. The big thing that really happened was in the early 2000s. Like, you know, there were a lot of accounting scandals. Uh, the biggest one was Enron, right? And what happened was um, Enron was sort of producing fictitious financial statements. We're using a lot of sort of questionable techniques. And their auditor, namely Arthur Anderson, who used to be like the equivalent of a big four firm, uh, they got in trouble, right? And when everything hit the fan, a lot of people who invested in Enron lost a lot of money. And basically, after Enron, plus you know, these other sort of scandals, uh, they did an act SOX, right? This Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So if you go into like public accounting auditing and you're auditing publicly traded companies, SOX is a big deal. It, it put a lot of uh, rules and regulations in place to help sort of prevent these things. 
Now, one of the things when you talk about like financial accounting, right, is like, what is the underlying theme or uh, do we want to be very like prescriptive uh, or do we want to be more rules based? So um, generally, right, and this is like always a question, but uh, if you were talking about GAAP, it's going to be more rules based, whereas IFRS, the international stuff, is going to be more principles based. And when we say rules versus principles based, rules is like very technical, like you must do A, B, C, step one, two, three. Uh, in following this. So it's very like, you know, minutia there, they give you a rule for everything. Whereas uh, principles based is more relies on like professional judgment, like in this specific circumstance, do ABC, right? And it's really letting the auditor uh, or the person preparing the financial statement gives them a little bit of flexibility, use their professional judgment to determine when this occurs and you know what A, B, and C means. It's not as prescriptive. Um, now, obviously, right, when you're talking about accounting, you have a lot of different like ethics setters. So the big one here is the AICPA, right? So I, when I was in practice at Deloitte, uh, they made you become a member of this. And it's kind of like a professional organization, right? Um, there's different ones, there's like the AICPA, at the state level, right? So like every state has its own sort of state board of accountancy. Uh, if you go into uh, managerial accounting, there's the IMA. And generally with these, right, the, the kind of like professional body, most of them are gonna have a code of conduct, right? Like a standard that tell you, you should do this, you should do that um, in, in an accountant. Right. And the idea with this, and I'm not going to belabor this, don't memorize this uh, for the exam, but the idea is like when we're accountants, we're protecting the public good, right? I mean, I, like I said, I know a lot of people have like a boring view of accountants, but we really have like a, an important purpose in what we're doing. Um, we're trying to like help others when they invest and, you know, other things that are important too, right? Like ESG accounting, environmental stuff, uh, that's a growing field. Right. So um, in this way, we need to make sure that when we sort of are being accountants, we're doing what we do, that we follow a certain standard of conduct. Right. We need to be ethical. We need to uh, do the right thing. Right. So uh, you know, I'll save kind of the specifics there for your later classes or your philosophy class with ethics. But just look over it. Right. Uh, there's a, an MCQ you can look at. Um, now. Moving and kind of reverting a little bit back to, um, you know, financial accounting and FASB, right? So we said FASB makes GAAP. One of the things you got to be aware of uh, is the conceptual framework. So this is kind of like the underlying framework, how they build it out conceptually for how we're going to sort of construct GAAP. Right. What is the underlying sort of theme or message or setup or configuration for how we produce financial statements in GAAP? OK, so uh, the idea with this is we have that fundamental objective up top. Right. We want useful information. Right. We're like Star Trek. We're a primary objective. Uh, who are we you know, using this for? Right. We're trying to. Whoops. Sorry. I'm going off screen there. We have that fundamental objective whenever we prepare the financial statements, right? That's kind of the end goal. Sandwiched in between, right? We have things like the elements of the financial statements, right? So those are these sort of uh, things that comprise it, right? So it's like, you know, the assets, the liabilities, the stockholders equity. And when we talk about that, right? In order for the information to be useful, it has to present certain qualitative characteristics. We'll talk about that. Um, and right, so it has to be like relevant and faithfully represented. Uh, and in addition, right, when we have those elements, right, we need to know at what amount to record them at. OK, so uh, this is just saying here we have the conceptual framework, right? It's kind of giving us sort of the fundamental reason, the, the construct for what's going on. We have the primary objective. Yeah, we're trying to provide useful information. Uh, with that, when we talk about useful information, it has to have certain characteristics to it. Specifically, right, the big things here are 
in order for information to be useful, it has to be both relevant and faithfully represented. So uh, it can't be or, it must be both. By way of example, right, uh, what would be something that's relevant but not faithfully represented? Uh, okay, here's our accounts receivable balance. Uh, it's at a million dollars. And by the way, uh, we're not telling you this, but we fraudulently uh, put that number there. Right? So that's relevant. We care about it, but it's not faithfully represented. It's not accurate. On the flip side, what's something that's faithfully represented, but not relevant, right? Well, this would be like, hey, we have a cash balance of two pennies. And it's accurate. That's great. But that's not relevant, right? It's not material. We don't care about two pennies. All right, so uh, do be aware of this is important to know kind of this framework here. I would this would be something important to know uh, and sub like sort of internal to relevance and faithful re representation. We sort of have like sub categories to it as well as sorry here. Uh, other items down here, right, that are across the board, right? We want financial ins information. Some of our goals are here. Uh, we want it to be comparable, right? It has to be verifiable. Where is it coming from? It's got to be timely, right? If you don't give me this uh, balance sheet uh, by year end, right, uh, maybe I have a really important decision to make and you don't get it to me in time. It's not, it's not useful anymore, right? It has to, in order for it to be useful, uh, it has to be understandable, right? So we kind of have down here these enhancing characteristics, right? So what's going on here? We're trying to have the goal right, of having useful information. In order for it to be useful, it has to be both relevant and faithfully represented. Each one of those words, right, have sort of sub characteristics to them. And on top of that, uh, in order for things to be useful, we have these enhancing characteristics that make it useful. Uh, overall, right, we have this kind of cost benefit analysis, which says, um, when we're producing the financial statements, uh, the cost of sort of doing something, uh, we need to sort of verify that uh, in light of the benefit, right? So the benefit has to exceed the cost, right? If we're going to spend a million dollars to uh, come up with our accounts receivable balance of uh, 50 bucks, right? The, you know, the benefit there is not going to exceed the cost, right? We need to make sure uh, that when we do this, that it's you know, fair, accurate, reasonable, as well as examine the cost benefit in light of the overall arching framework of we're trying to provide useful information uh, to external users because that's who we're really trying to protect. Some MCQs there for you to review. Uh, so we're talking about the elements, right? What are the elements? These are things like the assets, the liabilities, the equity. That's stockholders' equity account. You got the revenues, the expenses, the gains, the losses. And when we talk about the elements, when we talk about financial accounting, you do be you do have to be aware that there are some fundamental assumptions, right? Because if you think about it, we're trying to take a business in real life and put it on four pieces of paper, four financial statements. So to do this, we make certain assumptions, right? We have the economic entity assumption. We assume, uh, right, that the economic events uh, that are going on that we can separate uh, those and kind of put those in the financial statements. Um, likewise, we have the going concern assumption, which says, hey, we assume that the business is going to operate into the future. We have uh, sort of the periodical assumption here, which says, hey, we assume that this business, which could go forever, right, that we can break it down into chunks, right? Like here's an income statement for six months. Here's a balance sheet for the year as of the year end, right? Uh, when we produce and we look, we look at a business, right? A business doesn't just like stop six months in. We assume that we can kind of chunk that out like that. And finally here, the monetary unit assumption says that, you know, we think about uh, that money is the best way to kind of express and capture what's going on um, with it. So that's some of the ideas there. You can read the comments to get a little bit more on that there. Uh, next, we have recognition and measurement concepts, right? So we have our objective. We said we have our elements, things like our assets, liabilities, stockholders, equity accounts. They have to be uh, relevant and faithfully represented. But likewise, when we put them on there, the question then becomes, 
for how much, right? That's great. We know um, that we want our assets, our liabilities, our stockholders' equity. But what are the rules, the processes, the procedures for how we quantify that, right? And when do we quantify it, right? So when we talk about recognition, this really means when you book it, right? When you do the journal entry, you debit this, you credit that. Um, measurement is really saying like, all right, we know we do the debit, we do the credit, but for how much? And then disclosure is really saying, um, you know, do we need additional footnotes uh, to kind of explain more specifics? Is there something important that a, a reasonable third party would want to know that they're not going to see on the uh, front of the financial statements that we need to be a little bit more descriptive on? Okay, so Revenues here are inflows of assets or settlements of liabilities resulting from providing a product or service to a customer, right? That's basically a fancy way of saying, hey, your revenues are traditionally going to be your sales, okay? Uh, and we have here the revenue recognition, like the realization principle that says when do you sort of credit the revenue, right? Well, that's when the earnings process is going to be basically complete and it's reasonably certain as to the collectability, a uh, couple things here for expenses, right? So flip into the flip side here of expenses. Uh, we talked about we generally are going to record these when we incur them. How do we know here, right? Well, uh, they give us four approaches, right? Like a cause and effect approach, a matching sort of approach, um, an association approach. The idea overall with all of these is we're trying to sort of uh, take our revenues and say, what are... And how would we match our expenses to them, okay? Now, continuing sort of high level to talk about GAAP, be aware that uh, it implements a mixed attribute model. What does that mean? All right, well, traditionally, you think like balance sheet, historical cost, right? Debit, you know, you buy a car for 100 bucks, debit, car, credit, cash, right? It's like, traditionally, you think that, like, whatever you paid goes in the journal entry, and that's what you see. However, right, uh, that's only for certain items. If you look at a balance sheet, the income statement, it sort of depends what you're looking at uh, for how we measured and put it on there, right? The general rule is going to be historical costs, but there's a variety of situations where you would depart from that. Maybe you would use NRV, net realizable value, right, for things maybe like your receivables, uh, you could use current cost or present value, right? Or alternatively, uh, fair value, right? So maybe present value, uh, if you looked at bonds, right? You got to shrink those down uh, into today's dollars. So this is kind of going through just talking about some of those, right? Like historical cost, that's going to be what you paid for it. Um, you know, they, they talk about here NRV, current cost, present value, uh, fair value, right? So fair value here uh, used to be called current market value. This is really looking at the price that would be received to sell the asset or paid to transfer a liability in an orderly market transaction. And really, when you're talking about fair value, they give you three approaches, the market approach, the income approach, and the cost approach. And you know, some multiple choice, but this is showing us here, right? Uh, that fair value uh, hierarchy, right? The most desirable, the best to the least desirable, right? Sort of, you know, those inputs on it. Another MCQ uh, talks a little bit here about fair value. You can check that out. Uh, the full disclosure principle, what is this saying? So, right, we're talking about disclosure, footnotes. This requires that financial reports should include any information that could affect the decisions made by external users. So if it would be reasonable, a third party would or should know about this, we got to disclose it, right? It might be parenthetical comments. It could be disclosure notes, a supplemental schedule. Um, finally here, the last couple slides, this just says, uh, be aware that you know, GAAP is constantly changing, right? We have this tension between like a revenue and expense approach. Do we want to start with that and then back into the balance sheet? Or do we want to take the balance sheet uh, and then back into the income statement, use the asset and liability approach? Okay, so this is just talking about some changes there. 
so that's the high level summary, right? I want to keep these videos around a half hour just because it's like maybe a quick thing to help you review for the exam without like bogging you down. Obviously, more of the specifics we're getting into during class time, uh, but I do find that doing these and kind of taking the extra time outside of class really tends to help you guys for the exams and like understand it. So with that, we'll end the PowerPoint lecture here.